a marine biologist encounters something horrifying while exploring the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean. Over the course of the last few weeks of training, Booker memorized nearly every facet of the Tuscany. It was a remarkable feat of engineering, could withstand more water pressure than the sea could muster up at any achievable depth. And inside this matrix of layered syntactic foam, he would follow the ballast to the gratuitous and unexplored depths of Higgins Maw. He started the separation sequence, and the deep diver fell away from the escort and dipped beneath the surface of the Pacific. Then it was consumed in a whole new world, albeit one he'd frequented, that of the sea. Schools of fish swam by him, and when their cloud passed through a sunbeam, it glinted silver, and out in the rocks crawled the crustaceans that spruced up all the whitewashed stones like holiday ornaments. But he had an appointment to keep, and the oxygen tank was a demanding clock. So he dove right on past the old reef and out into the open waters, where the seabed couldn't be seen for many, many miles yet. The Maw, Reuben had said, 50,000 feet below the surface, Booker. 50,000. Do you know what that means? It means it's a whole hell of a lot deeper down there than the Challenger Abyss. He nodded at that. Are you ready to make history? Was he? He thought he was. He prepared for this lonely dive and nothing else for some years now. It was the culmination of a lifetime of work and study in the field. And so tight was its grip on his mind that he often dreamt of it in his sleep, of what he'd find at the bottom and what it would mean and what monstrous things might take offense to his presence there. No, no, he shoved that thought aside. Tuscany was all the protection he needed in that regard. It offered technology on the bleeding edge in lieu of a heavy hull. And that was enough to withstand enough water pressure to crush bones beneath skin and inches of steel. What animal had jaws more powerful than the ocean itself? So he hit the thrusters and down he went. He eyed the depth meter as much as he did the sea. 100 feet, 200. Sharks and turtles and uncountable fish swept past him. 300 feet, 700 feet. 1250, the inverse height of the Empire State Building. The water began to grain up and darken as the sunlight struggled to push on through. 2000, 3000, 32, where the light no longer shines. And soon, the only lights he had in order to illuminate the path ahead were those of the Tuscany. He'd continued the descent for hours. The pressure meter ticked up in spasmic bursts, soon ticking past the point where the weight of the sea would have crushed the steel of any other vessel. One mile down, 1.6, where even sperm whales hit their lowest dive. He could now claim with confidence that no mammal on earth was as deep at that very moment as himself. And still, he dove. 2.2 miles. The water was as black as space now, except for where the lights of the Tuscany pierced through it. Things were tight down there, despite the vastness of it all. 13,000 feet. The abyssal zone. Pressure stands at 11,000 psi. And he dove further. 3 miles. 3.1. Now, things get interesting. Mankind had visited these depths almost infrequently enough to count the expedition on a single pair of hands. He was now ranked among an illustrious few explorers, and although he wasn't the first to hit these marks, he'd hit the deepest one yet before this journey was over. 16,281.4 feet, nearly halfway to the world record. The Tuscany continued its dive. 20,000 feet down, the Haddle Zone. Pressure here is 1,100 times what it is at the surface. 29,000, the height of Mount Everest. 30, 31. The same distance as a commercial airline at the height of its flight. The Challenger Deep, what had previously been the lowest recorded place on the seabed, sat at roughly 36,000 feet below the surface, in the depths of the Mariana Trench. No light from the sun had ever come close, and to the best accounts, life existed there, but only sparsely, and the pressure is unspeakable. But Booker was going somewhere vastly deeper even than that. All we know is we found a canyon, Reuben had said. Dwarfs the Grand, sitting dead center in the Pacific seabed, about 1,200 kilometers west of Hawaii and another 900 south. And as far as we can figure, some 50,000 feet straight on down. 36,000 feet, he was now tied for the world record. 50,000 feet, why the hell are we just now seeing it? 36.5, he did it. His heartbeat swept up to a faster rhythm. He was officially a world record holder. No human being in recorded history had been that deep below the surface. New seabed scanning technology helped, gave us a more detailed topographical map of the hydrosphere than we'd ever had before. 37. So what's down there? 37.3. Hell, doctor, if we knew, we wouldn't be sending you, would we? I suppose not. 38.5. Higgins Maw, according to the best information available to him at the time of departure, is a pit roughly a full kilometer across. It begins at approximately 46,000 feet below the surface and is estimated to bottom out at Higgins Deep, a small valley that sits at its base, some 5,000 additional feet below that. The Maw is the largest and deepest such formation in the hydrosphere, and yet its dimensions and location are the only things concretely known about it. That, of course, is where Booker and the Tuscany come in. 
He hit the floodlights underneath the Tuscany, and the glow washed over an alien landscape that likely hadn't seen light in over a billion years. There were mountains here, mountains that rivaled the Alps. He even saw life down there in its depths. A squid-like thing of simply monstrous size swam on the sub. It stopped for a moment, and during that moment, he thought it might take offense to him. But after looking hard at the Tuscany and brushing a tentacle down the port side, it swam off in search of other things. At a girl, said Booker, he descended further, 44,000 feet, 45, and then all of a sudden, there it was, the Maw. It was a breathtaking sight to behold, a monstrously large and equally dark hole in the crust of the earth that plummeted to inconceivable fathoms. He descended a bit further, 46,000 feet. Somehow things were even blacker in the depths of the thing, even though sunlight had long since been blotted out. 47. He began to become aware of a low current pulling him downward. It wasn't particularly powerful, but it was unexpected, and that's when he saw it, a glow. He squinted and dimmed his lights to confirm the intuition. What in the name of God? It was there indeed, a dimmish reddish purple, then green, then purple again, and then blue, floating on a mist of current some few thousand feet down. He resumed the dive to chase it. 49.5, 49.9. The glow, whatever it was, was getting deeper and wider and brighter. Soon, it lit up the whole path down and ahead. He dimmed the Tuscany's underlights to their lowest setting. And by 50, this cave isn't a straight pit. And sure enough, the hole bottomed out here and then opened up to its left. Holy God, holy God. It was a cavern chamber, and only the enormity of its radius maintained the darkness of it despite the presence of thousands of floating bioluminescent pods that pulsed purple, green, and blue, then red, and dimmed in the interim. He took the Tuscany in deeper and her camera's word to life. The caverns became darker still when the pods faded into the water behind the ship, but there was more things to be seen here than rocks. Tuscany, about a quarter hour after entering the chamber, soon floated by a bizarrely rope-like plant of utterly impossible size, one that appeared to stretch nearly across the height of the cave and grew wider at the base. He took the submarine in for a closer inspection and hit her lights to their fullest setting. Clack! His heart dropped. There were suction cups on it, each one as big as the Tuscany herself, and they writhed and pulsed across and down the full length of what was now very clearly a tentacle. In panic, he shoved the Tuscany back and away from the thing, but when he tried to turn it around, the base of the hull collided with the beast and stuck fast to one of the cups. He gunned the thrusters and could hear a wet tearing sound as the machine ripped itself from the grasp of the cup. But then suddenly, the tentacle came to life. It whipped and whirled and smacked around the cavern and pressed itself to the roof, and then it fell down, deep beyond where the darkness blanketed the floor. Come on, baby! He hit the thrusters again and Tuscany rocketed off the way it came, through the darkness and off towards the pods, whose glow he hoped would afford him an opportunity to shut the lights off the ship and make his escape. If only he were so lucky, but very soon he began to hear and feel the movement of something unspeakably titanic rolling across the floor of the chamber. It rumbled and thundered and shuddered and shook. Soon, clouds of dirt and rock flew up out of the black pitch and blanketed the view forward. The sound erupted across the entire breadth of the cave at once. My eardrums nearly burst and likely would have had it not been for the muffling of the explosion provided by the walls of the Tuscany. The submarine shook, but she held up her integrity well enough for him to fly on past the floating pods towards the yawning mouth of the tunnel that would take me back out into the ocean deep. Smack! The Tuscany buckled and rolled with an impact. The tentacle, I realized, had shot up from the ground and hit the bottom of the ship between her ballast. But luckily, it knocked her with force upwards towards the tunnel. He rolled the Tuscany with the hit and managed to regain some control. And he boosted the thrusters into the turn and up again. Now, back into the maw. Then he began to climb. 52,000 feet. 51.5. Come on, baby. Come on. Don't you fail me now. Don't you freaking fail me now. Tuscany ascended with panic speed, and all the while she did it, he could feel the rumbling of the tentacle's pursuit in the walls of the pit. It smashed its way on through the tunnel and whipped and thrashed, but the Tuscany was too quick a runner. 47, 46, climbing high. The Tuscany burst out of the maw and was about to rocket straight on back to the surface, but the tentacle flew out beside her, nearly smashed her in the front window. He bent the controls to the edge of their set casting, and the Tuscany tanked to the left and missed the ground by inches. He hit the lights again to navigate the labyrinth of rocks as he struggled to remount the climb. But in the light of the ship, he saw it. Those weren't rocks. Those were massive vessels, imperial warships from ages past, bent and crooked and broken at the bottom of the sea, pulled down here by whatever it was that now threw its back to my devouring. He took the Tuscany through this nautical graveyard with far, far too much speed for his safety. Under ship towers they went, and through cannon mounts, and past the blades of dead engines and around upended rudders. The entire ground for countless miles shook and rumbled with seismic force. It was thunderously loud, and it picked up speed and violence with time. The Tuscany flew up and headed upward. 44,000. Come on, you mother... <laughs>
The water itself seemed to shift with the sound, and then out of nowhere, the Tuscany was no longer the only thing spilling light to the abyss. An orange glow flashed across the sea, and for an instant illuminated nearly the entirety of its vastness. Then, it blinked. Then, it flicked on again and stayed active. He shut off the Tuscany's lights to preserve every molecule of power for the ascent. 44-2, 44-4. 44-3. Beside him, in the glow, he could make out other creatures retreating, ones of spectacular size, again, that mankind had never cataloged and that he sadly would not have time to at all study. There were city bus-sized manta ray-shaped things, wrapped up in cloud wisps of transparent jelly, and even that squid the size of a building, all flying upwards in a mass panic. He led the charge. <laughs> He looked behind him and down through the rear window. The mouth had moved. It was alive. God almighty, I was in the Leviathan's throat. I was in its damn throat. He saw its tentacle-like tongue lash out of the mouth and collect enough fish to feed a small town. The Tuscany rocketed ever upwards as the Leviathan whipped even larger tentacles behind it and gained speed with the force of a hurricane. The Leviathan opened its mouth yet again and spewed forward its tentacle-like tongue, and with it, it whipped up several Olympic swimming pools worth of water into a gale force maelstrom. As he ascended upwards, he noticed the giant squid he ran into earlier wasn't able to escape. He made it out of the whirlpool by just a foot. It snapped its mouth shut with a thunderous, echoing snap. The Leviathan pursued him relentlessly, riding on the flood of its own current. Its tentacles, each dozens of feet across, and at least a mile long, beat the water back and tried to gain speed for their host. <laughs> the Tuscany's speed proved worthy, as he was now at 27,000 feet, but the Leviathan did not give up chase. He could feel it doubling its efforts. The displaced water rocked the Tuscany, and she buckled and rolled in the synthetic current. Then, he heard the maw open up behind him and the water began to whip and swirl into a frenzy by the ocean load. He punched the thrusters to the breaking point. Come on! The reinforced glass began to chip ever so slightly. The chips broke into cracks, and those cracks began to crawl across the width of the window. He checked the gauges. 20,000 feet. 19. 19.3. The ascent was slowing. Come on, baby! Come on, come on, come on! Please, God, be with me now! Be... In the orange glow of the Leviathan's eyes, he could see how quickly the water was slipping by the Tuscany and getting swept up into the maelstrom. The submarine began to sway port to starboard and shudder and shake. He watched the gauge with nauseating desperation. 15.95, 15.92, come on, come on, come on! 15.925, 15.924, shoot! And that was it. The Tuscany was caught. No sooner did the depth chart begin to slip than did he feel the whole sensation of the submarine lose all sense of control and tumble backwards and around. He was thrown out of his seat and smacked his nose against the roof of the pilot's sphere. Bloodshot everywhere. He grabbed his face and began to apply pressure, hoping to slow the blood loss. But the Tuscany again flipped ballast over ballast to starboard in the whirlpool and spilled him into the hatch ladder. He felt his shoulder dislocate and his kneecap smack into the bottom rung. His head swam and still the Tuscany tumbled backwards. The cracks were spreading faster. He could smell the inside of the beast's mouth through the hull of the ship. But then, all at once, and not a moment too soon, he got an idea. It wasn't a good one, but better than nothing. He managed to limp and tumble his way through the controls and grip the handles as the ship rolled. Wait for it, wait for it. Now! The sound of the roar was so close every last control surface in the sphere rattled in its case. But then he flared up the thrusters, full blast, and at an angle. And the Tuscany shuddered and flipped and shook, and with fortune, fell straight out of the maelstrom, with just inches to spare. The Leviathan's maw grazed the starboard side, and the impact sent him into the roof while the ship rolled end over end again. He smacked his ribs up on the dip in the alcove and fell back down into his seat head first, and then fell onto the floor. He was free, but only just. The Tuscany tumbled, banked, and rolled, slower now in absence of the whirlpool's flood current. He tried to steer away, but it was useless. The ship flipped around the back of the Leviathan's titanic maw and up over its head as the beast flew on by underneath him like a freight train. And for the first time since catching its eye, he began to fully appreciate the magnitude of this monster's size. Its back was an endless snake-like and sharp fin spine the size of a minor mountain range. And only quick maneuvering moved the Tuscany away from the jagged back fins that chugged up towards him and sliced open the sea itself. The current they'd swept up sent the submarine reeling backwards off a bit further and into relative safety. He quickly dimmed the lights to their lowest setting and caught his breath as the full form of the Leviathan washed on past him. It stretched far away into the abyss below for well over a mile, and dragging away behind it were thousands upon thousands of tentacles, a forest of the things, each the size of a six-lane highway and tipped with razor-sharp hooks and a flurry of wing fins. It took a full three minutes for the beast to pass by him fully, and then it curved around in the other direction and swam off in search of other things to devour. Then it was gone. He surfaced hours later, having allowed the battered Tuscany to take its time with the journey. She was solely responsible for his escape. A marvel of engineering indeed. Once he did break the surface, he dispersed a distress beacon and then promptly collapsed from exhaustion. He was picked up by the Coast Guard some hours after that, a few hundred miles southwest of Hawaii, and pulled from the near wreckage of his submarine. He was taken to a hospital in Hawaii where he recovered. 
During his recovery, he heard isolated chatter of a tremendous seismic activity near where he'd been, and how the whole ocean floor had changed and moved and shifted form. But he couldn't care less. He told the bastards what he knew. And on top of that, they have the Tuscany and they have all the recorded evidence. And you now have this written account. What everyone does with this information now is entirely up to them. As far as Booker, he won't be doing any diving anytime soon. He's come to the realization that mankind has more than enough space to expand throughout and live upon and thrive in, above, and near the surface and on land. But there are things in the sea that hold ownership of the deep, and perhaps it's best to leave it that way for all of our sake. Stay in love, stay in light, be kind to others, and stay tuned. I am out. All right, y'all, things have been going crazy in the alien disclosure community. More and more information keeps getting poured out, and it's kind of hard to decipher at this point what's real and what's fake. As you all probably know, they debunked the alien footage I showed the other day in my video of the alien, alleged alien behind the fence. A lot of big time newspapers and media companies are debunking the video, saying it's CGI. Now, I don't know, it's either here nor there. It's what it is, it's the narrative as the moment that it's fake. Do I believe that? Those of you that watch me know how I feel about debunked videos. We'll leave it there. But what's crazy is more people with ring camera footage have been coming forward with alleged sightings of the UFO. Here's a couple of those videos. Ring cam footage from another neighbor. Then, out of nowhere, this creator on YouTube, who normally posts videos that get literally hundreds of views, that's it, on video games that he plays, starts posting videos about the UFO in Las Vegas. Then he goes on to say somebody sent him this ring footage of an EBE, an extraterrestrial biological entity, that fits the description of what Angel, the original 911 caller, said it immediately racked up like 1.5 million views i mean this guy had no traction then out of nowhere his video in a matter of days gets 1.5 million views and then recently he posted today just four hours ago and he's already got 40,000 views just wild i don't understand it uh the only thing i can say is the ring footage that he allegedly was sent is very interesting i'm not going to share it though because upon him sharing it when he went to upload his last video he was completely stripped of his monetization on YouTube after posting this alleged ring video. He's tried to research the source, he can't find it, and he basically deems it as legit. I'm going to let you go ahead and go on to his site, check it out for yourself. I'm not going to post it here because I don't want to risk any type of demonetization. This along with all kinds of whistleblowing going on in the military. Two different gentlemen who are former military have been whistleblowing on ETs and UFOs. One of them is 36-year-old David Grush, a former intelligence officer and an Air Force veteran. Some high-ranking government officials like the Inspector General are taking his claim very seriously and are going to be investigating it. His claim is that there's a top-secret military operation that seeks out wreckage of alien craft. They confiscate the craft and then reverse engineer it, making their own alien-type craft. These are then used to carry out unique military operations. Now, some of these operations seem to be somewhat controversial. That's where this gentleman comes in, Michael Herrera. He recently spoke at Dr. Stephen Greer's UFO disclosure event, and he let out a bombshell of information. His claim was that back in 2009, almost 14 years ago, while stationed in Japan, and he was part of the 7th Naval Fleet, and he was on the USS Denver. He was 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, which was the most decorated infantry crew in the Marines at this time. His crew, while stationed, was then called on to do humanitarian operations out in the Philippines. This was called Operation Kasana. But while he was there, his superiors heard that there was an earthquake near Indonesia that may cause a tsunami. Where this earthquake hit was the western part of Sumatra, Padang City to be exact. So they called his ship, the USS Denver, and only his, which seemed odd, to go give relief in that area and help with a certain mission. This mission surrounded some possible family members of President Obama being within the city. Apparently there was a SEAL team there that was going to get them and extract them. But the reason they called in these gentlemen, it was a crew of six, his crew, was because Indonesia is known for high terrorist activity towards United States military. But as he was briefed, he was told they were going to bring in medical supplies, food, etc. So they drop anchor and they get on the bird 
and fly to the southwest corner of the city of Badang. At the time, it was completely in rubble, fires, you name it, the worst case scenario. The pilot was then given information where he could drop them, and this was about six to seven minutes away from where they were at. So they flew there. Once they deemed the landing zone clear, they dropped the Marines, but then told them that they need to get the high ground to survey the area. He had a little Panasonic camera on him, they climbed 300 meters, and he turns it on and begins to record, and as he's panning the area, he notices something sticking out like a sore thumb. This is an octagonal shaped craft that seems to be floating just above the trees. At this point, they are baffled, they don't know what's going on, but they decide to push forward towards the object. After getting down the slope, they were now about 150 meters away from this craft. They all could blatantly see it. The chopper they flew in on could easily have fit three under it. He figured the craft to be 300 feet. It seemed to be matte gray and have some sort of texture or design to it. Plus, it had a pyramid type structure at the very top of it. Again, the hum sounded like that of a guitar amp, very distinct, and it was floating about 20 feet above the ground. As you can imagine, they were all dumbfounded at what they were seeing. As they were observing, they were intercepted by a team of rogue soldiers that were dressed in all black. They had no military insignia on them whatsoever, black caps. They had the best of the best in weaponry, M4s with ACOGs and night vision scopes, night vision goggles, you name it, they had it. So it's obvious they were some special ops team because they had the best military equipment. There were eight of them. He could literally hear their safeties flick off and they were screaming at these men. And mind you, that these men all had American accents, basically asking who they are, what they're doing there, that they could kill them right now, and nobody would ever know that they'd bury them in the jungle. As you can imagine, as he looked at he and his crew, his crew members were terrified. They all were. They pretty much thought there was a good chance they might not make it out of the jungle. That's when this team began patting them down, taking all their weaponry, etc. After doing this, they then told them to provide their military ID, which they keep in their left pocket. They knew exactly where their military IDs were. They took them out, they scanned them with their phone, and they put it into some directory that was already on their phone that would provide validity to these IDs. So as this was happening, they were watching what was going on behind them. There were two armored trucks, F-350s, with weaponry crates in each truck. They then noticed these containers. These containers seemed to be airtight, and have tanks on the side of them that either were vacuum sealing it or providing oxygen. Apparently another whistleblower came forward to Dr. Greer and told exactly what those containers were and what was in them. Now, I'm not going to say here what was going on there. The trucks had four guys on each one and they were unloading some cargo onto this platform. After doing that they left. This whole time the guys are still being searched and one of them is saying stuff like, should we take them out? Should we take them out? What are we supposed to do? What should we do? He said the craft then lowered down onto the cargo. It connected to it somehow and became one. The craft then floated up to the top of the trees, each corner of it illuminating a blue, red, or green light. He said as it rose up, it made no noise. It got just above the tree line and then it shot off towards the ocean at up to 5,000 miles per hour. I believe it's faster than that. It did this without any rotor wash or rocket wash. The coconuts in the trees didn't move at all. None of the trees even budged. It just flew off at a ridiculous rate of speed. As this is happening, they're told to turn around and they all thought they were done. After turning them around, they gave them all their stuff back, their ammo, their M4s. They just made sure they couldn't load them up or use them. And the men that were all dressed in black took off and that was that. Eventually the men realized they could go. They went back to their ship. They were told not to say a word. So they got back to their ship. They talked to their superiors. They didn't say anything. They were given a short break where they could go to the town. It was kind of like a relief from duty. When they got back, Mr. Herrera realized that all of his stuff was gone. Each of them, their cell phones were taken. The camera that recorded the video, he had it buried in his locker. That was gone. Basically, any intel of what took place was stolen while they were in town. So somebody knew that this took place. Their encounter was known by somebody on that ship. The footage was never recovered. But what I believe took place here is two military branches that were not in opposition, but they wanted to do recon on each other. There was two military branches here, two superiors. Somebody knew what was going on with this craft and the cargo. So they wanted some recon on it. They set these guys up to do it. They didn't know what they were actually doing. They disclosed it as a humanitarian mission, but it was actually a recon mission of what was going on with this group dressed in all black in this craft. I believe it was intentional at the end of the day. This was an intentional encounter by a higher ranking official in the military, and it was a recon mission at the core of it. Pretty crazy stuff. It turns out that, and I've been saying this for a while, I believe that we do have reverse engineered craft and we are using them. It's just, what are we using them for? Some people aren't sure it's for positive things. 
Now, is that true or not? I don't know. At the end of the day, very interesting stuff. Let me know what y'all think in the comments. Stuff is wild out here. The alien stuff is crazy. I can't believe it's all happening right now. Why? Who knows? Just let me know what you think in the comments of all that's going on. Stay in the love, stay in the light, be kind to others. I am out. A dragon caught on film during the SpaceX Falcon 9 launch on May 10th. Yes, you heard me right. A SpaceX camera caught a dragon during launch on May 10th. This was brought to my attention by a follower sent me a message on Twitter. It took me a second to find the footage in the actual SpaceX film of the launch, but sure enough, it's there. And y'all, this dragon is insane. I know many find it hard to believe, but dragons do exist. They're highly intelligent and they can fly way up into the atmosphere. And I really don't understand why people find it so hard to believe because dragons date back to biblical times. In fact, dragons are mentioned in the Bible up to 31 times. A lot of it has been stricken from the Bible, but older texts that haven't been fabricated actually have awesome stories that pertain to dragons. One of the most renowned stories worldwide, but mostly concentrated in Europe, is that of St. George the Dragon Slayer. I honestly couldn't believe I hadn't heard of this story up to this point because it's so popular. He's known as the patron saint of England. And believe it or not, he was actually a real person, a Christian who fought in the name of Christianity. Depending on the country, there are different variations of the story, but generally, they're all the same. In the account Legenda Aurea, St. George is said to have passed by a city called Selene, which is a province of Libya. Beside the city was a pond, and in this pond lived a dragon, which envenomed all the country. It poisoned the people, so the people of the city decided to feed the beast with two sheep each day so that it would not continue to harm them. When the dragon's appetite was not satisfied, the people of the city began sacrificing human beings to it. The actual verse in the book states, Then was an ordinance made in the town that there should be taken the children and young people of them of the town by lot, and every each one as it fell, were he gentle or poor, should be delivered when the lot fell on him and her. Now when they say lot, they actually mean lottery. So the town would put all the children's name into a basket and then draw to see who was to be sacrificed to the dragon. And this was regardless of stature, whether you were rich, poor, a laborer, or a king. You were not exempt from this lottery. And then one day, the lot fell on the king's daughter, who was prepared to be offered to the dragon. It was during this time that St. George passed by the city and saw the princess. When he inquired as to what was going on, St. George was told about the dragon. And it was at that moment he decided to slay the beast. The battle with the dragon, as described by Dvorogin, is as follows. Thus, as they spake together, the dragon appeared and came running to them. And St. George was upon his horse, and drew out his sword, and garnished him with the sign of the cross, and rode heartily against the dragon. And he smote him with his spear, and hurt him sore, and threw him to the ground. And after said to the maid, Deliver me your girdle, and bind it about the neck of the dragon, and be not afeard. When she had done so, the dragon followed her, as it had been a meek beast and debonair. So the dragon emerged from the pond while they were conversating. St. George made the sign of the cross and charged it on horseback, seriously wounding it with his lance. He then called to the princess to throw him her girdle, and he put it around the dragon's neck. Wherever she walked, the dragon followed the girl like a meek beast on a leash. The princess and St. George led the dragon back to the city of Selene, where it terrified the people. St. George offered to kill the dragon if they consented to become Christians and be baptized. 15,000 men, including the king of Selene, converted to Christianity on the spot. George then killed the dragon, beheading it with his sword, and the body was carted out of the city on four ox carts. The king built a church to the Blessed Virgin Mary in St. George on the site, where the dragon died and a spring flowed from its altar with water that cured all disease. This is the story that made St. George a hero, and the Knights Templar even rode in his name. Crazy stuff, right? It took four ox carts to tote the dragon out of the city, and it was poisoning the well, basically, at the city of Selene. Now, it's possible that it was a real account of a dragon. Stories like this, and even stories of Alexander the Great encountering dragons, are what 
cement it in history as possible reality, not folklore. I just thought I'd give a little context, a little history, backing the idea that they could possibly still exist. But check out this footage, y'all, and let me know what you think in the comments. This stuff is awesome. So you'll see I do multiple clips, then I zoom in, then I slow down. Check it out. Did you notice how fast it dove and how high up into the atmosphere it was? These creatures are absolutely amazing. I don't know what it is about them, but they are absolutely fantastic. It dove faster than I've ever seen anything fly. It was unbelievable. And we were just lucky enough to actually capture the footage. I'm surprised they didn't edit it out of the actual original SpaceX footage, but they didn't. So there you have it. Let me know what you think in the comments. Why would it be fake? Who would add that in there? It doesn't make sense. Stay in love, stay in light, be kind to others. I am out.